Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in. This is uh, Ryan Leach. I work at La Mama, and welcome to Live Talks Take Six. Today, we have a very exciting uh, panel. We are going to be talking about New York nightlife and how New York nightlife is responding to the quarantine in New York City. Uh, we have an incredible panel today. Uh, we have Wo Chan, West Dakota, Oscar Inye, Josh Sharp, and Ty Sunderland. And I'd like to do a quick introduction of all of them. Uh, so Wo Chan, also known as Pearl Harbor, is a poet and drag performer. West Dakota is a Brooklyn-based drag queen, artist, designer, and model. Oscar Inye is a New York City-based DJ and one of the co-founders of Poppy Juice. Josh Sharp is a New York City-based comedian. And Ty Sunderland is a New York City-based DJ and producer. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of them uh, here today. You can all sort of turn on your cameras and microphones. And real quick, I wanted to say that anyone who's watching can feel free to ask questions on Facebook Live at any time. Our URL is www.facebook.com uh, slash LaMama NYC. And we're happy to take any of your questions and give them to the panelists. Um, also, if you'd like to, uh, we'd like to thank our donors at La Mama that allow this to happen and make this possible. And if anyone would like to make a donation for La Mama, you can text La Mama Live to 4431. That's all lowercase, La Mama Live to 4431. And before we begin, we'd also like to say that we understand that it's definitely a privilege for all of us to come together here today to have this conversation about something that's very important and all of the great work that our panelists are doing. And we understand that during the quarantine and the global pandemic, a lot of people are facing some significant obstacles and um, are overcoming a lot. And we feel very privileged to be here today with all of you. All right, um, to get started, I think the first question that everyone wants to know is, um, and feel free to sort of also say your name and give a little intro of yourself after what I've done. But uh, we wanna know um, how has this quarantine affected the work that you all do? Um, and also how have you all made the decisions to take uh, your performances and your parties and your events online? If anyone would like to start. Whoever is brave enough to be the first. Yeah, you're all like, you would all do any I'll, of I'll go first, I'll go first, that's fine. <laughs> um, I mean, all my work has just been completely paused for right now. And so I initially was not thinking, even thinking about streaming parties or anything. I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know how that technology works, but I did one and um, it was really, I did one back in March, like right at the beginning of it. And it felt really good to just have everybody come together the same way they would at a party even though it was digitally and it, it, it felt like a party, even though it was not, you know, we were all in our own apartments. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm raising my hand. So before the quarantine started, um, I made half of my income by teaching poetry to high schoolers and like plaza dancing to like Chinese grannies. And then the other half was from performing or like reading poetry or doing nightlife stuff. And once quarantine started, uh, that came uh, ended very quickly. And so, um, of course, there's like this, this big financial loss, but I also didn't expect the kind of like the emotional kind of blow that it would hap that happened. And um, for a couple of weeks, I really tried not to push myself into doing anything or making anything. I just kind of let myself be a person. And um, I think that was a good move, uh, at least for myself to take care of me. Hi, so I'm West Dakota. Um, I'm a drag queen and a performer. Um, so before all of this started, um, sort of, I guess, early March, um, there was still a lot of like conversation about coronavirus and like coronavirus in New York, what was going to be the state of, I guess, our lives um, in the coming months, weeks, etc. And so around, I'd say like the, the 13th, I had a, a party um, that we ended up canceling before 
we went into lockdown. Um, and it's just, it's such a weird, um, I don't know, it was such a weird dynamic because um, as like a nightlife performer, we are um, just constantly surrounded by people. Um, we're just like in very like close contact with everyone. And so it was, it was a really hard decision to like cancel that party, but it felt like the responsible thing to do at the time. And then um, I think the next day is when we went into lockdown as a city. So um, it was kind of like, we ended up just acting really fast. I, I have a show with a couple other people and um, we knew that we kind of just had to jump on doing these digital performances um, because nothing like that was really happening at the time. Um, so I don't know, it just, it made sense for us to um, sort of do something quickly and just react. I feel like drag is always like reacting to the zeitgeist. Um, and so we took our show onto Instagram live and that week was like, one of the biggest shows that we've ever had, which is kind of insane. Yeah. Um, oh, hi, I'm Josh. Um, I'm a comedian. I would say the like my network of performers are usually people who are doing a lot of live performance, but then also doing a lot of like, or at least trying to do a lot of writing and acting and sort of all of them have it depends on what percentage of your like time and livelihood is um, is live and what is like gigging. Um, and often it's, you're spending a lot of time in the live spaces and it's not always paying you um, in actual dollars that you can pay rent with, you know? So like, I think depending on each person's situation and that's particularly true of like all my live gigs were canceled but then there's you're, like figuring out what other kind of like writing work you can be doing. Um, and I think particularly for my slice of comedians, which is like more of like Brooklyn queers, alt, what's called alt comedy. So not your like traditional stand up, less like what's the deal with airplanes and more um, here's a story about my butthole. But um, I think that kind of slice is like more rooted in like a weird, like a lot of them are not like guys who are going out and playing, um, you know, like Laugh Factory in Cleveland all the time. So though uh i think a good portion of us have lost like work it's a lot of more losing like that community of that so similarly i think a lot of them have moved stuff to like instagram live and online spaces but i do personally find that um comedy to a muted audience is um demoralizing so i think you're seeing like a lot of comedians like do more like chatty stuff and like talking to friends and finding ways to sort of like or just doing like true like let's embrace the weirdness and like what is comedy like when you're doing it to no one. I know every time I've been asked to do like a proper comedy show, I end up just being like, what if I played my piano instead? Because it sort of does feel like you have to like find ways to like root what you're doing in this new space where it's like, I'm getting literally no feedback from the audience. And that is sort of like the currency for comedians, I guess. I'm done. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Oscar Enya and uh, I'm a DJ, cultural producer and also the co-founder of uh, art collective called Poppy Juice. And for us, I guess, or like for myself, I think um, this whole transition into online started pretty much as soon as the quarantine was announced. And I've been since then doing live sets on or live stream sets. But I think as Josh mentioned earlier, as a DJ, that's so, you know, I try to play off of the crowd's reaction to every song. And also just like, I really thrive off of the energy that the crowd is giving me to play, to continue playing. It's It's been, that's like been a really big creative challenge to sort of like try to, uh, unless you're looking at the chat comments, which can be kind of fun sometimes, but also that's like another dark hole where there's like also, it can also be very like, uh, detrimental to like creating but um i felt like it's it's hard it's hard to live stream a set when you're not getting an, like a crowd response to it you know but i think we were as poppy juice collectively we were extremely hesitant to start doing something online just because our work for the past seven years in new york city has just been about ga gather physically gathering people together you know and 
our work is centralized around a joy that we create when we gather like queer and trans people of color together and not being able to do that like in a physical space made us like bogged us down creatively a lot but ever since the last couple of weeks we've been sort of activating like online spaces a little bit differently we just had our first official event a couple of weeks ago and that went really well and people seem to appreciate like the community aspect of it or like at least being in community with people even if it's through the screen so we're excited to kind of like try to keep working with what we have i think something that was a big of a bit of a breakthrough for me was just realizing that it's not the same and it's never going to be the same and i think that's something that i would recommend to like everybody that's like oh but there's like these online parties happening now and it's like it's it's it is it's exactly that it's an online party it's not like the parties that we're used to and once i realized that and once i like convinced myself that it's okay that it's not the same and that it doesn't feel the same i felt like more confident in the sort of like outlet that it is amazing point yeah um again i want to remind anyone who's watching you can tune in to uh ask questions on facebook live and we'll pose them to the panelists whenever we get a chance. Um, I, I heard a lot of you talking about all the different people that are involved in your events and in your performances. And I was just wondering, you know, since nightlife is so connected to community, how have you all been staying in touch with all of those moving parts, right? Like the other performers, um, the producers, the event spaces that you are in contact with. Um, and also, have you seen the attendees at your events sort of change? Are they different? Are they the same? Anyone can sort of jump in on that. Sorry, I'll go. Um, so for, for myself, I feel like um, I've really been trying to um, just play with the, the format of um, or the digital format of whether it's, you know, Instagram or Zoom or whatever, and really like use that as a tool um, to be able to connect in like different ways with uh, my collaborators. Um, so like one thing that, that we've been doing with our show, uh, which we host on Instagram Live, um, is we'll do like a, a split screen. So there's one person on top and one person on bottom. And um, we, we play a lot with that dynamic we'll do things where like someone's arm is like reaching through the screen and like someone's roommate will be like the arm on the other side or we'll do like a split screen with like the top half of someone's face and the bottom half of someone else's face slips into a song um and so i feel like um we've just been having a lot of fun playing around with this new medium um as far as the the audience goes um we definitely, there definitely is a shift. It's really cool to see people um, outside of like the New York community, like tuning into these shows, but also just people who are maybe not necessarily, um, you know, going to go see a show on a Wednesday night, you know, at a bar in Brooklyn. Um, I feel like that, that in itself can be a barrier for people even in the city. Um, and so, taking things online has been sort of like a, um, I don't know, like there's sort of like an equalizing factor with that where um, people have more access to, to the show and to us as performers. Ty, you wanna jump in? I will say my audience has changed quite a bit. Like, um, I see so many people from like Chicago and LA tuning into the live streams. And then, you know, occasionally people pop up like, Oh, I'm tuning in from New Zealand or Australia or Asia. So I think that's like one kind of cool thing that makes this whole mess kind of more interesting than it, it could have been. Yeah. Like Ty was just saying, like, this is something that's a global event. So it feels like our global community in terms of poppy juice, at least like, we're way more connected, which has been really nice. And so a lot of people for the first party that we did a couple of weeks ago were saying that they were really excited because this is going to be the first 
Bobby Juice that they've ever been able to attend because they haven't been in New York at a time or like have never been to New York before. So that was really cool. But I think for, in terms of like our collective work, we've had to, we are so used to like meeting as a collective. I uh, run Poppy Juice with Mohammed Fayaz, who's like our art director, and then Adam R, who's the co-founder and resident DJ. And so for the three of us, it's always really important to meet in person and we don't live together. So we haven't been, we haven't been able to meet in person this whole time. So we've just like have had to schedule weekly meet virtual meetings now, which feels really like weird to us because we just thrive off so much of just like that in-person connection, but it's helped us sort of keep a rhythm going in our work and also a routine, which is something that I think during this time personally has been really helpful in terms of for my creativity and like my work ethic to just have like something to look forward to every day as boring as it may be. And that, that leads really well into a question that somebody who's watching asked uh, from Jamie Lowenstein. They're asking, what is your energetics experience like post-event when you click out and are back to isolation? Or are you able to sort of, are you, can you hear what I'm saying? Yeah? Okay. Or can you, um, are you able to recreate those kinds of experiences? I'll jump in. Um, for for me, it's um, it it's it's kind of interesting. Like um, feeling like the sensation of performing for an audience. Like I still get um, this sort of like adrenaline rush, this high. Um, but then it's it's so it's so weird to like perform and then not have an audience in front of you. Um, and for me, like the the way I've been describing it is like. There's just no way. There's nowhere for the energy to dissipate. So a lot of the time, it can feel very, um, very like depressing after a show um, to feel this high, and then all of a sudden, like just come crashing down, and like all of a sudden, you turn off the camera and you're like alone in your living room, wherever you know. Um, so at least for myself, like I've been trying to, um, you know, not maybe not recreate moments but just um trying to like reconnect with people after the show is really important for me so like I'll like hop on FaceTime with some friends and like just have like a wind down like you know talk through what happened in the show um sort of like what I would do after a show at a bar like outside having a smoke break whatever you know um yeah. and I feel like that's been sort of like a saving grace for me it was fun. The last time we did a show together, Dakota and I actually FaceTimed each other after the show just to like catch up and just to like be with each other and sort of like calm down off of the high of performing. And that honestly was probably like the first time after I've performed that I've felt like a, a little bit more stable. Before that, I felt like I found myself getting really emotional actually after every performance and um, even like crying after every performance just because like I, I just like there's so much going like there's so many emotions and like that it's it, it was like I didn't know what to do with it. Um, it's been interesting to me to see how for a lot of like comedians who are in nightlife but like a maybe three hour earlier version of nightlife than some of the rest of the panel a lot of like the other people who are talking today, like a lot of their events, IRL is our after plan. Like the the Brooklyn queers like all do shows and they're like, where are we going after? And then go to Love Prism or go to Poppy Juice or go to Oops. And so it's been funny to watch some of these things even in the digital space become these meetups where it's like, when I think it was Guap X was doing like a club quarantine takeover like last week, were, do any of those um, proper nouns make sense to your audience? I wonder, but we'll blaze right through it. Um, when that was happening, um, there was a weird thing where, you know, these are parties that are happening on Zoom such that there's this weird almost like facsimile of seeing each other in the club where the club hosts can show the DJ on the screen, but also have sort of like a kiss cam mode where you can just pan around and see people. And so there'd be this thing where 
we would be here and then I'd be like, oh, and it's Bowen and oh, it's Joel Kim Booster. And you'd feel like, oh, the girls are out tonight even though we aren't in the same city. So I think it's been fun for us to see that like some of where we're meeting is the same spaces as before, just now they're digital sometimes where our text thread is like, you know, who's going to Love Prism tonight? And then it's like, people are checking into the same live stream just to like have some facsimile of our previous version of a hang, which was to just go to these other dear people's parties. Yeah, that's really interesting how you all are also attending other people's events and you're participating in nightlife also as like a, like a participant and not just as a professional. Um, and I was wondering, do you all feel that you're like, we talked a little bit about how you're doing jokes without laughter in the room, you're DJing sets without having like the human bodies in front of you. Um, do you feel like you're able to sort of like help others recreate that or do other nightlife figures sort of help you recreate that in your digital events? Maybe, Whoa, if you want to say something about that. Can you clarify that recreate? Can you ask that question once more? Yeah. Like, do you think that as people who participate in nightlife as professionals, are you able during quarantine to go to these digital events and help others like recreate their performances, recreate their parties? And do you feel like having nightlife figures in your events helps you to recreate that too? I think it's definitely very lovely to see people you recognize, the same people that come to your shows in the comments. And I think that's, I mean, there are so many accidental features that are popping up um, that are kind of defining the experience. And the the peanut gallery, as it were, is like one of the places where like your, your friends and like, uh, your regulars really get to show off their wit and interact with your performance in a way that isn't possible um, before. I might be a bad person to ask this question to because I'm actually kind of avoidant to nightlife as much as I love performing. Um, it, I, I mean, and it's, this is a weird, uh, I'm, I'm a part of the nightlife world. It's just that like, I find it very difficult at times to be there as someone who doesn't necessarily like drinking or like loud noises or like being around a lot of people a lot of the times. So there are, again, strange features that are popping up where it's like, oh, I don't have to be out super late and uh, I can wake up and teach my class and I don't have to drink if I don't want to and um, I don't have to pay for a car. Um, that being said, there's really no comparison though. Like I would rather have physical nightlife back than this um, if I had to choose one, because the experience of performing is so different. It's, um, it's not as gratifying at all. And it feels like I'm in a snow globe when I'm doing the thing I love to do, um, before and after the show, um, before the show, uh, if there's a huge crowd, I usually have to like sit backstage and talk to myself, you know, like give myself a talk. And, and those, those jitters don't disappear until I hear like people cheering and then, I, and then the spirit comes or whatever. Um, but when I'm performing on Instagram live, I'm just nervous the whole time. And then immediately afterwards, I'm checking the comments to see like, did people like it? Was it good? Did like, was it good? And it's just like so much uh, need for external validation. And the worst part is, I mean, it's hard to, maybe I'll stop talking now, but yeah, I would love to hear from someone else. No, that's so valid. I'm really glad that you added that. Um, that's very interesting. Maybe um, West, I know you said a little bit about hosting these, about like feeling the need to sort of talk to keep the talking going. Yeah, totally. I mean, like for for me, I guess it's like um, the first live show that I hosted by myself, I, I kind of had this realization where I was like, oh, if I don't talk right now, the room is just silent, you know? And like the comments might be like rolling, but I don't know, for me, it's like that that energy just really affects me. So I would sort of like um, dip into like this inner monologue where I'm just like saying everything that I'm thinking at the moment, like, oh shit, I have to put on my nails right now, you know, like, um, but sorry, what the, the question was about um, recreating um, these moments of nightlife. Yeah, um, I feel like, there's there's really no recreating what nightlife does for us. Um, I think I think if anything, it's just giving people a different form of like escapism, which is what nightlife is for so many people. Um, so if you can like put on a show and like take someone's mind off of something for you know like thirty minutes or an hour, however long, like um, 
I think it accomplishes its goal, but it's not, it's not the same as going out and like dancing with your friends and forgetting about the world in that way. Um, I kind of wanted to move on to, we're about 15 minutes uh, away from ending. So I wanted to move on to sort of the last question that I'm most interested in hearing about. Uh, so La Mama has been around since the 1960s and a lot of uh, nightlife performers have sort of come through La Mama from like the Warhols, the factory, people from the pyramid, people from um, all a palladium, all these different institutions. So we love like intergenerational conversation. And I was sort of wondering about what you all think uh, the future will look like. Um, having gone through the quarantine producing these events, um, what do you think is next or how do you plan to move forward? Um, well, that's a simple, easy question, Ryan. Thank you. I'm happy to answer. Um, I do think that like, I think we have to embrace that a lot of this is like stopgap measures, right? That it's like, we can't necessarily think that just like, great, this is like, this is stuff that will continue to exist after this because there's elements of it that are just like filling in holes for something else. But I hope that there's like little small parts that, um, that we might like either the spirit of it we might embrace or tools that we might be able to keep using. Like the thing I think I was saying to you yesterday, Ryan, that I keep thinking about is in my world, at least I'm seeing something fun about um, just like access to get around gatekeepers or, or thinking more connected to your public. Two things that come to mind is that one, like my dear friend Cola Scola last week released a full hour long special that he filmed in his apartment. And I think the normal mechanism for like putting out a special would be that you, you try to pitch it to networks and you sell it and yada, yada, yada. And to do something like Cole did would almost feel like, wait, so did no one buy it? It would feel like, and in this era, it feels like, no, no, no. I just made this thing. I wanted to give it to you. So there's like that direct access. And then also the other way I'm noticing it where I got asked yesterday that like, apparently there's like Elmhurst, um, the uh, Elmhurst Hospital, their like graduating class normally does uh, like a big party and they like, you know, like do it, roast each other. Of course, they're not having any parties. They're all working in COVID hospitals right now. So their, their head um, of the department has asked a friend who's a comedian to get 18 comedians to all film videos, sort of like lightly roasting different people. And that's a kind of thing. So yes, I am a hero. Just wanted to say you're clapping for me at seven. Um, but I do think that like that's an access the other way that if you're this person who's just like organizing a party for like graduating, you know, doctors, you're never like, oh, you know what I have access to a bunch of comedians on both coasts. So I think like it, there's like elements where this like um, having access to work and to your public and feeling like you can just like give things to people in both directions without like always having to jump through so many hoops. I sort of hope some of that we keep on to that it's not like, you know, that like Cole releasing this thing just to the internet is like extremely valid, even if it's not on Netflix, you know, that we can like strip ourselves of some of that and just think about like making things and giving them to people. Yeah, that's a great answer. That's a huge question. And if anyone else sort of has an answer or we don't have an answer is also completely valid. I, I hope that um, after this, like we do take elements of this whole like streaming party element to real parties. Cause like, you know, it, it gives people who are not in New York City a chance to experience New York City without, you know, maybe they're, you know, in the middle of nowhere and underage and, you know, there's all these barriers that they have that they could not be able to, you know, get to New York, but they get to experience New York and experience community that, you know, that they're experiencing now through these, you know, online events. I think for me, this question is actually really kind of, um, it's a lot like the uncertainty of the future for me as a nightlife worker is really, really scary actually. Um, so I think for me, something that's helped me sort of stay on course and just like hopeful is thinking about how many people have mentioned that they wish they didn't leave that party early or that they're never gonna like not go out when their friend invites them. So just like realizing how much, at least in New York City, nightlife is such a part of our culture. Like we live, a lot of people live in this city to, to participate in nightlife and like to be a part of it. And so I just hope that there's more, I, I, in a way like, just like more support for it, but also just like a, like a renewed love and renaissance of nightlife. So just like more 
events, more people doing different things, more performances, more comedy, more music, just like, I'm just excited to see like, like sort of like a renaissance in nightlife from this. And I, and I really like, I'm, that's like my hope. And I like sort of like try to like tell myself that every day and not fall into despair. <laughs> No, that's great. And um, that actually leads into another question that somebody asked, which we can sort of um, go forward with is uh, how can brands and businesses support New York City nightlife right now? And you can either comment on that as like an individual or as a performer, as a producer, as uh, a DJ. Uh, how can these businesses and these brands support you? Money, ho. And how do they get it to you? They're sort of asking. Are there websites? Are there uh, nonprofits? Should they just attend your shows and give it to you that way? Or what's the best way? I think for, for me, like I, I've been thinking a lot about this, um, especially now that we're in May approaching June. Um, I feel like June is like you know, the, the corporate, the time for like corporate sponsorships for queer people. Um, so I don't know, I, I feel like um, just sort of deferring to queer artists in this time and allowing them to like create work um, and sponsoring that work. And um, I don't know, just giving them tools and resources to be able to um, create work and maybe that's also advertising your brand as well um, but yeah money sponsorships yeah and I don't know exactly hi it's Wo Chan again um, I don't know how exactly to articulate this but there's also the way that money affects power and that um, the usages of money can be used to sway just better leadership question mark um I guess I'll leave it at that I didn't I haven't I didn't full, full uh form a full sentence but while it's great to receive money as a queer artist and I know it's so big in June um and I doubt that uh queer artists will receive the same amount um as they did last year um I I just know that a lot can, can be done uh when you have a lot of money and I wish that the flow of money or influence could move up uh, rather than just buying representation. Yeah, it's a great point. And um, I, I just want to one more thing, actually. Um, I think beyond representation, like actually, actually just like hiring queer artists to be the ones who are like in the writer's room or who are like working creative behind all these projects. Like I've, I've worked with so many brands where I'm, I'm like realizing like as I'm talking to them that they like everyone behind the project is like straight, white, et cetera. And just like have no idea what they're talking about and sort of just want to use the image to, you know, to promote their campaign, but don't actually have anything behind it to support that. So um, yeah, hiring queer people and people of color to um, create, create for you. Amazing. Um, and lastly, before we sign off, I would just love to hear if anyone has anything that they'd love to promote. Um, I'm sure the people watching would love to see you all perform and play music and uh, see these events uh, in real time. So if uh, you want to plug real quick, please do and let them know. And this information will also be available on La Mama's website after this talk back for everyone. Hi, uh, it's me, Wo Chan again. Um, so I'm performing with uh, my drag collective, Switch and Play, this Saturday at 9.30. This is their Instagram. Oh my gosh, I don't know. You put it somewhere. It's the words Switch and then the letter N and then Play, and it's at 9.30. We've got a great lineup. Thank you all so much. Um, I'll be actually... Um... DJing for Bafo, which is a really great nonprofit that uh, put up puts up a festival in Fire Island, like a performance festival in Fire Island. So I'll be DJing their annual gala, which will be on Zoom this Friday. 
Um, it's called Friends with Benefits. You should look it up, B-O-F-F-O. -F -O. And then on May 16th, we have our second, uh, our second Poppy Juice online event. And that's going to be on Saturday, May 16th from 8, to 8 p.m. to 12 a.m. I guess I'll go next. Um, my next event is actually May 16th too. So after Poppy Juice, if you want to come to Love Prison, we're going to be going from 11 to 2 a.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. It is red light district themed. So you just wear red while you're streaming. It's because the party is like color themed. So it's encouraged that you wear the color, but that's it. Um, sorry. Um, it is Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. And um, this Saturday and Sunday, Bubble Tea um, is hosting a two-day um, uh, uh, weekend of programming. Um, so on Sunday, um, me and Dynasty are hosting a paint and sip where we will be doing makeup and talking with a um, bunch of performers, um, makeup artists, beauty insiders, etc. Um, and it will be sort of a pregame for the after party that they're having later that evening. So yeah. And also um, raising money for two organizations that I do not remember what they're called, but it's a good cause. So come through. Um, I, I'm not really doing any comedy online right now, and I'm so sorry that I can't plug anything. I think you should go to all these other people's events. And also think about the fact that, you know, it's not that hard to hire a queen or a DJ to play your Zoom party or your corporate digital morale event. You know what I mean? Um, and then personally, I don't know, you can follow me on Instagram, I guess. Cluck, cluck, Josh Sharp. Uh, send nudes. Amazing. Oh my gosh. Thank you all. I wanted to, um, this all sounds so exciting. I also, I guess I didn't like preface this uh, panel with the fact that I, uh, everyone on the panel is a, like a big part of specifically queer nightlife. I guess that's just like my favorite part of uh, New York's nightlife. So, but that's fabulous. Um, and then I Ryan, love it. Did you just come out to La Mama? Was this you coming yeah. out? Yeah, I'm gay. Thanks. Congratulations, um, Ryan. <laughs> you know, big moment. Um, so speaking of La Mama, I just want to say thank you to all of our sponsors and all of our donors for allowing this once again to happen and bringing all of these wonderful people together for me to moderate. It is such an honor to talk to all of you about these important things that you're doing. And I think it's really cool. And if you would like to uh, donate to La Mama once again, you can text La Mama Live to four, four, three, two, one. And that is the easiest way to donate so that we can keep doing. Ryan, you cut out. I can't hear you. <laughs> Ryan, we can't hear you. Ryan, text in the chat what you wanted to say and I'll do a dramatic reading of it. All right, does it work now? Oh, shoot, it does. Did you hear all shoot. of that? Okay. I almost booked an acting job, but. <laughs> so um, that's, uh, that's all for us. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please support all of these people. Um, and we'll be back next week, uh, Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So please tune in. Thank you so much.